Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. You've probably heard the name before, but what do you really know about this man who's gone down in modern history as one of the biggest drug kingpins? Number 50. Let's start with some personal details. On April 4, 1957, he was born in a place called La Tuna in Sinaloa, Mexico. This is just a small rural community, the home of what you might call simple farmers. His father was a cattle rancher, although unofficially, he grew opium. Number 49. As for how life was, well, it was tough. Joaquin was the eldest child of the family. He had four younger brothers and two younger sisters, although he had other siblings that died young. When he was in third grade, he dropped out of school, which left him functionally illiterate for the rest of his life. If you're wondering what functionally illiterate means, it basically is being able to read and write a bit, but not enough to work in most jobs. His writing skills weren't even good enough to pen simple letters, which is why he had people write love letters for him when he was in prison. We'll talk about those later. Number 48. El Chapo sold oranges and candies as a kid to earn extra money. His mother once said about her young son, even as a little child he had ambitions. His sister Bernarda said back in those days, he'd always been able to make some cash. Then he'd buy a bunch of fake gold jewelry and show it off while visiting family members. Number 47. When El Chapo was still a young kid, he used to save little pieces of paper that he'd cut into the shapes of bills. He'd get a wad and tie it with a band, pretending it was real money. His mom later said he'd count and recount them, then tie up the little piles. Ever since he was little, he'd always had hopes. He told his mom to save the papers for him and hide them from his father, who, as you'll now see, was not exactly a good influence on the kids. Number 46. With the nearest school being about 60 miles away, El Chapo had little chance of getting any kind of education in his teens. Instead, he grew opium with his pop, but his pop would sell the stuff and usually spend all the earnings on booze and women. Number 45. He started working for his uncle, Pedro Aviles Perez. This guy was one of the first agricultural entrepreneurs to realize a lot of cash could be made by sending drugs over the border to the USA. He cultivated both opium and marijuana and is said to be one of the first people to use planes to get weed over the border. He was shot and killed by a Mexican federal cop in 1978, likely set up by an up-and-coming trafficker. Such was the life. As you'll see, drug kingpins tend to stab each other in the back. Number 44. El Chapo then started working for Hector Luis Palma Salazar. Just to give you an idea of the environment these guys worked in, Salazar's wife and children were murdered by a rival. More bloodshed followed, of course, but let's stick with El Chapo for now, who was no stranger to violence. Number 43. Maybe he had a little man complex because he was always trying to impress when he was coming up in those days. He had to win at any cost. During those early days of smuggling, he had one very simple rule if you worked for him. That was, lose the drugs and you will die. He meant it too, shooting men who had messed up a shipment. Even if someone decided to buy drugs at a lower price, not from him, that could end with them getting shot in the head. He ruled by fear and it worked for him, which impressed the higher-ups in the Mexican drug world. It's how he came onto the radar of the boss of bosses, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. Number 42. Also known as the Godfather, Gallardo was one of the guys that started the powerful Guadalajara cartel. This man had a lot of political connections, he was almost untouchable, and with his contacts in Colombia, he sent an unprecedented amount of cocaine over the border to the US. He set up something called the Federation, which consisted of various branches or plazas of Mexican gangs. Each of these criminal gangs got all the drugs they wanted, but just as important, they received the protection of corrupt cops and politicians that Gallardo had in his pocket. Basically, because US drug enforcement had been very good at clamping down on trafficking by Colombia's Medellin and Cali cartels, the Colombians decided to let the Mexicans do much of the trafficking. This is how weed exporting farmers turned into giant criminal enterprises. We can't say these were peaceful times, but the Federation days were certainly better than what was to come. Back in those days, El Chapo and Ismael Zambada Garcia were given control of the Pacific Coast operations. This would later become known as the Sinaloa Cartel. Now you'll see how arrests create power vacuums and how they lead to violence. Number 41. Gallardo got arrested. In 1985, DEA agent Enrique Kiki Carmena Salazar was kidnapped. He was tortured and then killed. This was revenge for the destruction of millions of dollars worth of weed. The DEA launched a massive investigation after that, concluding that the Mexican officials and politicians had been working with the narcos. Gallardo was seen as the man behind it all and responsible for the DEA agent's death. Now the Federation didn't have a leader and El Chapo saw an opportunity. Number 40. From October till May 1987, El Chapo moved 4,400 pounds of weed and about 10,400 pounds of cocaine to the US. He made about $1.5 million, most of which he sent back home to Sinaloa. He was just getting started, but the people from where he came felt the cash injection. 
they would soon begin to refer to him as Robin Hood. Number 39. In 2020, new reports surfaced that the relatives of El Chapo were handing out much-needed food parcels to the people in Sinaloa. El Chapo's face was printed on the packages. In fact, right after he started making the big money, some of it went to fund hospitals, clinics, and schools. He even helped build roads and other infrastructure. He wasn't the first to do this. Pablo Escobar had done it, as had the heroin trafficker from Burma, Kun Sa. Before you get all teary-eyed, just listen to what else El Chapo was capable of. Number 38. The story comes from a former bodyguard of El Chapo, Asayas Valdez Rios. He said that when El Chapo was in hiding, one day he got a telephone call. His men had captured some guys that worked for a rival cartel. After he put down the phone, El Chapo said, they're sending us a gift. When they got the gift, three men, El Chapo, beat them with his own hands. He broke their bones with a large stick. Finally, he shot the men and had their bodies burned. The same bodyguard said his boss also had a man buried alive. For being a bodyguard, he was paid just $175 a week. He said that while there was sporadic violence, most of the time he just sat around sending and receiving messages on his phone. He told the court, sometimes I hardly ate, even when Mr. Joaquin would rest in his cabin. I would try to sort of rest, but I'd have a small radio with me and he'd say, Mamin, what did so and so say? Mamin, say this to so and so. Still, he said another day on the job might mean being part of a hit squad and executing someone. Number 37. Before El Chapo got to be the biggest drug lord in Mexico, he was renowned for being able to get drugs across the border. Those not close to him were often not sure how he did it. One of the reasons for his success was the tunnels he and his men built. They were the best tunnels around, better than anything the other narcos had constructed. In later life, such tunnels would come to El Chapo's rescue. We'll talk more about that later. Number 36. He also sent cocaine across the US in tins of chilies. The brand name was La Camadre. According to news reports, he smuggled $500 million of cocaine that way. 55% of the money went to the Colombian gangs that sent over the cocaine and the rest went to El Chapo and his men. We're not sure how much the grunts got, but they got really high since the cocaine filled the air where they did the packaging. Number 35. One of his tunnels ran from a house in Mexico and stretched to a house in Douglas, Arizona. To get to the door of the tunnel, a pool table needed to be lifted by hydraulics. Number 34. The cops found that tunnel, but none of El Chapo's men ever went back to it. That's because he was tipped off by a police chief named Guillermo Gonzalez Calderoni. He received millions of dollars from El Chapo. Number 33. Once the federation was no more, the boys from Sinaloa got into a war with the Tijuana cartel. This led to lots of blood spilled on both sides of the war. El Chapo narrowly escaped being assassinated more than once. Number 32. One time, El Chapo's men got into a gunfight with their enemy in a disco. Both sides fired over a thousand rounds. Not surprisingly, people died, six in total. Number 31. On May 24, 1993, gunmen from the Tijuana cartel thought they had their man. They were told El Chapo was hiding in a car at Guadalajara International Airport. Around 20 men filled the car with bullets, but El Chapo was in another car. As for the occupants of the wrong car, one of them was the Cardinal and Archbishop of Guadalajara, Juan Jesus Posadas Ocampo. Six other people were killed too. El Chapo heard the gunfire and was able to sneak off just in time. Number 30. It was this murder of innocent people that made El Chapo a household name in Mexico. Only then was his face on the front of newspapers. It is after the assassination of Cardinal Posada that authorities began to tell us there are big drug lords and that one of them is named Joaquin Guzman Loera, alias El Chapo Guzman, one investigator later said. Number 29. The Catholic Church in Mexico disagreed, saying it was an execution gone wrong. It said the shooters knew exactly what they were doing. Cardinal Juan Sandoval Inez said forensic evidence pointed to it. He said the assassinated cardinal had been outspoken about how some high-ranking politicians were a bit too close to organized crime. He believed the hit was a conspiracy, which was perhaps one reason why El Chapo got away so easily. Number 28. Still, he was a wanted man after the airport shooting. He hid for a while, likely with the help of corrupt officials. He also handed $200 million to one of his men for the running of the Sinaloa cartel. If he should get arrested, he gave the same amount to another man, money to take care of his family. Number 27. On June 9, 1993, El Chapo was picked up close to Guatemala-Mexico border by the Guatemalan army. He was subsequently sentenced to over 20 years in prison for drug trafficking and other offenses. When asked if he was a drug trafficker, he said, I'm a farmer. As you'll now see, prison didn't set him back so much. Number 26. He was treated like royalty in the prison with the guards acting as his very own servants. He not only got what he wanted in there, but he was able to manage the cartel along with his brother Arturo. We won't mention Arturo again, but we will tell you he was eventually shot and killed. Number 25. El Chapo certainly had his hands full during his wars with his enemies. But according to one former narco who talked with Newsweek, 
the U.S. authorities helped him and his cartel out quite a lot. That's because El Chapo was allegedly acting as an informant for the DEA, telling the agency about his enemy's trafficking routes and where they were about to send something over to the U.S. He also filled agents in as to who had killed who. According to this narco, he'd personally go and visit U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement and start talking to agents, who, he said, were always very polite. He told Newsweek one of the ICE agents said they were here to help the Sinaloa cartel. That might sound strange, but that's how the war on drugs has been fought all over the world for a long time. The book Drug War – The Secret History details how law enforcement in the US and the UK had many secret informants. The downside for the authorities is traffickers have manipulated the agencies. A professor at the University of Texas said the Sinaloa cartel was duping US agencies into fighting its enemies. Even worse, when hitman and gangster Juan Carlos Ramirez testified in the US, he told the court that El Chapo bribed corrupt DEA agents with prostitutes, gifts, and apartments. Number 24. El Chapo's Lawyer, Humberto Loya Castro, also gave information about other cartels to US law enforcement. It was heard in court that U.S. authorities agreed not to go after El Chapo or any other member of the cartel in return for information. They were also allowed to carry on with their trafficking business. Number 23. His empire only grew while he was in prison, perhaps helped somewhat because he was informing on his rivals. Still, after serving around eight years, he wanted out. Laws had changed and he could be extradited to the U.S., the country that had paid for his lifestyle and wanted him behind bars. Word on the street is that El Chapo had his cell door opened by a guard, after which he was taken through a bunch of other doors while hidden in a laundry basket. He was subsequently bundled into a car trunk and driven away. 78 people in all were involved in the escape, which cost El Chapo $2.5 million. Many of the people on the payroll were prison officials and the police. That's one story at least. Number 22. Another version of events says it wasn't a guard that opened the door, but two very high-level officials of the government. Now, let's see El Chapo's softer side. Number 21. We promised to tell you what he wrote in those love letters. He actually had 18 kids with seven different women, but these words were for his lover, Zulema Hernandez. These days, my only comfort is thinking, especially thinking of you. Another went, darling, these days my only comfort is thinking, especially thinking of you, and of a day that I can hopefully live my life by your side. In November, he wrote, Love, Christmas is around the corner and nothing would make me happier than being close to you, your skin and your lips, but everything is uncertain. Even though I haven't lost sight of seeing you, I don't want to promise any specific day because then it doesn't work out. Number 20. She ended up helping his cartel traffic tons of cocaine and might have gone to prison again for a long time if it weren't for El Chapo's formidable lawyers. In 2008, her body was found in the trunk of a car on the outskirts of Mexico City. She'd been shot in the head and the letter Z was carved into various parts of her body. That stood for Los Zetas, El Chapo's biggest rival. Number 19. In 2011, El Chapo's new partner and current wife, Emma Coronel Aspuro, gave birth to their twin girls. At the time, there was a $5 million bounty on his head, so his name wasn't on the birth certificates. In 2018, he famously started crying when he saw them both appear when he stood trial. Let's now see what happened to some of his other kids. Number 18. Some of his kids are now all grown up and helping run the Sinaloa cartel, which, while still strong, is arguably not top dog anymore. In 2020, two of those sons, Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar and Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar, sometimes called Los Chapito, were threatening people in Mexico who weren't staying indoors during the pandemic lockdown. Offenders only got a spanking, not killed. The same news story said his daughter Alejandrina was providing care packages for families in need. One of his daughters, Rosa Isela Guzman Ortiz, currently lives in the U.S. and works as a businesswoman. She has never been one to stay quiet, telling the media she thinks her father is not the man the media and the authorities have made him out to be. She also said he's never had that kind of money the media says he has. Number 17. Where all that money went to is still a mystery. The Guardian newspaper wrote that the cartel's profits from drug trafficking was $12,666,181,704, citing an official document used at his trial. That cash is still MIA. We guess we better tell you now how he even got to that point. Number 16. In 2006, there were 2,119 murders related to the drug war just in Mexico. That went up each year until 2011. The number was 12,358. This led to various crackdowns on narcos, and just in 2010, 53,000 of them were arrested. The thing is, only 1,000 of the arrested men were associates of the Sinaloa cartel. Because of this, some people said the Mexican president Felipe Calderón was on the side of the cartel. As you already know, there is the strong allegation that he worked with the DEA and U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. 
Nonetheless, good things never last when you're a criminal, and it seems El Chapo's days of having protection came to an end. He became Mexico's most wanted man and spent much of his time hiding out in the mountains. On February 22, 2014, he was finally arrested. Number 15. U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder said El Chapo had caused the death and destruction of millions of lives across the globe, calling the arrest a victory for the citizens of both Mexico and the United States. The U.S. still wanted to extradite him. He was looking at a sentence of 300 to 400 years in prison. El Chapo had other ideas, as you'll now see. Number 14. He might not have enjoyed special treatment this time in prison, but he managed to escape again. On July 11, 2015, he entered a tunnel that went from his shower all the way to a house just less than a mile away. The tunnel was not just some dirty crawl space. It was 5 foot 7 inches in height and 30 inches wide. It was filled with lights and air ducts and high quality building materials. Even a motorcycle was found down there, either used to carry stuff or for El Chapo to ride during his escape. Number 13. His wife, Emma Cornell, is currently in prison in the U.S. She's pled guilty to federal drug trafficking charges, although U.S. authorities have also said she was behind his 2015 escape. News reports say she had to pay $1.4 million for that escape, which involved buying a plot of land near the prison and also doing a lot of digging. It seems she also paid some officials off since a number of arrests were made. Number 12. Now an embarrassment to the Mexican government, it put up a reward of $3.8 million for information leading to El Chapo's arrest. Again, he hid out in the mountains among people that worked for him. He also had the support from many local people who still adored their Robin Hood figure. Number 11. The United States was furious again, with one official saying El Chapo had trafficked more than a line of cocaine for every single person in the U.S. As you'll soon find out, this might have been true, but it was also kind of a pointless statement. Drug flow never really stops, or at least it's only gotten worse over the decades since the war on drugs started. Number 10. As for El Chapo's personality, this is what one writer said about him. He had more mistresses than you can probably fathom. This was his existence, having sex with strange women and micromanaging every detail of his operation. A prison psychologist said he was egocentric, narcissistic, shrewd, persistent, tenacious, meticulous, discriminating, and secretive. One celebrity in the U.S. should know that better than anyone because he got to meet him. Number 9. While El Chapo was still hiding out, the actor Sean Penn rubbed shoulders with him. Penn was under no illusions that he was meeting with a dangerous man, writing this in a Rolling Stone article. I've seen plenty of video and graphic photography of those beheaded, exploded, dismembered, or bullet-riddled innocents, activists, courageous journalists, and cartel enemies alike. The security was about as strict as you can get, but after numerous flights and lengthy car drives, Penn ended up in what he called mountainous jungle. After several more hours, he finally walked into a house and was greeted by El Chapo. Penn wrote, he's wearing a casual patterned silk shirt, pressed black jeans, and he appears remarkably well-groomed and healthy for a man on the run. El Chapo told him later, talking about politicians, I keep my opinion to myself. They go do their thing and I do mine. At another point he said, I supply more heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, and marijuana than anybody else in the world. I have a fleet of submarines, airplanes, trucks, and boats. Here are a few takeaways from a subsequent email interview Penn did. El Chapo said he got into the drug business at the age of 15 only because it was the only way to put food on the table. He said he didn't feel bad about what he did because he felt he was given few options in life. He also said if he didn't do it, someone else would. As for the violence, he said that was mostly down to envy and snitches, but he didn't feel like he was a violent person. Asked how he felt since he escaped, he replied, lots of happiness because of my freedom. That feeling wouldn't last long. Number 8. On January 8, 2016, he was arrested again, with the Mexican Army and Federal Police, Mexican Navy Special Forces, bursting into the house where he was staying, killing five men. El Chapo almost got away again but was picked up later by cops while fleeing in a stolen car. He offered them bribes, which they turned down. He then told them, you're all going to die. The authorities found assault rifles, armored cars, grenade launchers, and more weapons back at the house. As you'll see, this was nothing compared to what the entire cartel owned. Number 7. It's said the Sinaloa cartel has employed around 20,000 soldiers and hitmen. Most were and still are armed with very modern weapons. On top of that, the cartel has at least one submarine. It also owns 15 helicopters, more than 100,000 armored vehicles, and about 500 narco tanks. The latter is not a real military tank, but trucks fitted with armor and guns. They come with turrets and weapon bays and usually have battering rams attached to the front. The closest thing you might have seen to one is in the movie Mad Max. Number 6. El Chapo didn't want to be extradited to the U.S., where he knew he'd have to spend the rest of his life in prison. A Mexican judge involved in his extradition was assassinated in 2016 while on his morning jog. 
but a few months later El Chapo was in the U.S. standing trial. On July 17, 2019, he was sentenced to life with a forfeiture of more than $12.6 billion. That means the state has the right to take money or property to that amount. The hunt for El Chapo was over now, but like the myth of Sisyphus, the job wasn't done. Number 5. The drug war costs the U.S. taxpayer around $50 billion per year. Over the decades, it's cost trillions. Just hunting El Chapo cost billions. His trial, according to reports, cost $50 million. This has resulted in some folks asking if it's all worth it. A growing number of experts in the U.S. call this system whack-a-mole because no sooner than El Chapo was in prison, he was replaced. Number 4. In fact, now he's staying at America's most secure prison, ADX Florence. The amount of cocaine coming into the U.S. hasn't really changed. Overdoses, meanwhile, have been going up, mostly because of the powerful drug fentanyl being added to heroin and the rather shady business of Big Pharma's legal opioid drugs. In fact, in 2020, drug overdoses were up almost 30% in the U.S. This is what Jeffrey Miron, the director of the Department of Economics at Harvard University, said about the drug war and El Chapo's arrest. We are choosing to throw money away to stop something we are never going to stop. So all the bragging and boasting about locking up El Chapo is meaningless. The counter-opinion is that drug use will worsen if there's no war. It would also be just as hard to dismantle a big industry. Number 3. The homicide rate in Mexico rose significantly after El Chapo was behind bars. 2018 and 2019 saw record high drug war casualties amid all the turf wars. Some cities looked like war zones. Even in 2020 during the lockdowns, the murder rate barely changed. On top of that, authorities pointed out the worrying fact that cartels were murdering more journalists than officials. Some experts have explained this by saying when law enforcement gets better, organized crime gets more violent. On June 7, 2020, a record was broken in Mexico that was for the most murders committed in one day. The previous record was 114 in April 2020, and the new record was 117. The violence, of course, was mostly cartel and drug-related. Much of it was down to a new name in the media, El Mencho. This new supervillain is the head of the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, now called the most violent cartel and the biggest criminal drug threat to the USA. It could be the biggest drug trafficker to the US right now. Although US authorities reported in 2018 that the Sinaloa cartel still filled that position after El Chapo's arrest. Here's how one crime expert compared El Mencho to El Chapo. He's very secretive. He does not show himself. He's not a man of the people like El Chapo, who cultivated that cult of personality, a little bit like Pablo Escobar. He's part of an evolution of drug kingpins who want to keep themselves in the shadows. For that reason, you probably won't hear much about him. But make no mistake, he's as bad as anyone that came before him. Number 2. As for life behind bars, El Chapo doesn't get to do much at all except look at four walls in his tiny cell. Even when he's allowed out of his cell, it's just to a covered yard. According to his lawyers, he gets no natural light at all. In his own words, El Chapo said, It's been torture, the most inhumane situation I have lived in my entire life. It has been physical, emotional, and mental torture. It got worse during the pandemic because prisoners weren't allowed visits. Even the few hours a week given for exercise was canceled to prevent prisoners from getting near guards. Still, we're sure the families of his victims won't mind this kind of suffering. Could he escape once more, though? Number 1. The answer is no. No way. He's staying in the most secure prison on earth. There's no place to tunnel, and even if he managed to somehow get out of his cell, the entire prison is fitted with pressure mats that set off alarms. Even if he could get outside the walls, there's no place to run. The former warden said the extreme circumstance he's kept in is a fate worse than death. He's housed in the most secure unit called Range 13. It literally drives men crazy. A former inmate named Jack Powers can attest to that. While he was in the secure unit, he bit off both pinky fingers and removed his earlobes and other bits of himself. No one knows how long El Chapo will stay in isolation, but it's likely going to be a long time due to his history. We imagine now that he can only dream about those good old days when he used to sell oranges for enough pesos to drink cold soda under a blue sky. Now you need to watch El Chapo vs Pablo Escobar. How do they compare? Or have a look at this.